This is Asia Tonight. Good evening, I'm Dawn Tan. Tonight's top stories. Myanmar protesters rally outside the Chinese embassy in Yangon. They accuse Beijing of supporting the military coup. Joe Biden presses Xi Jinping on Hong Kong trade and human rights. In the leader's first phone call since the US election, China has warned confrontation would spell disaster for both sides. Tokyo 2020 chief Yoshiro Mori to quit. He's decided to go days after sexist remarks sparked an outcry in Japan. A breakthrough after months of deadlock. China and India agree to pull back frontline troops along their disputed mountain border. A COVID cluster grows in Melbourne. It's linked to the UK variant of the virus. People are being asked to come forward and get tested. I'm Steve Lai. Also tonight, chilling security videos dominate the Trump impeachment trial. Senior politicians, including former VP Mike Pence, are shown fleeing for their lives. And separated by the causeway, border closures force Malaysians working in Singapore to spend the festive season away from family and friends. I'm Eugenia Lim with your Asia Business Update. Analysis reveals COVID could have hit the Singapore economy twice as hard as it did if it wasn't for the government. Plus, Malaysia's GDP suffers its worst slump in more than 20 years. Myanmar has arrested dozens more politicians and activists as protests continue against the military coup. Now demonstrators are also taking aim at China, claiming Beijing supports the overthrow. Protesters have also received a boost from U.S. President Joe Biden, who's ordered sanctions against military leaders. Hundreds have protested outside the Chinese embassy in Yangon. They accuse Beijing of supporting the military government. China has denied this. It's also rubbish social media reports that Chinese planes have brought in technical personnel to Myanmar. Across Myanmar, similar scenes are playing out for a sixth day, despite concerns that the military might soon take a harsher stance against demonstrators. A local civil society organization has tweeted a draft cybersecurity bill sent to telecom companies. That bill would allow the army to order blackouts and website bans. It would also require social media platforms to hand over users' data. A new wave of detentions has also begun. A close aide to ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi is the latest high-profile arrest. Kyo Tin Sweep served as Minister for the Office of the State Councillor. Leaders of the former Electoral Commission have also been arrested. And the U.S. is doubling down on that pressure, with President Joe Biden taking his strongest actions yet. He slapped sanctions on military leaders who directed the coup and their family members. Mr. Biden will identify the first round of targets this week. What impact will the U.S. sanctions have? More on the evolving situation in Myanmar later on Asia Tonight. U.S. President Joe Biden has pressed Chinese leader Xi Jinping on Hong Kong trade and human rights in their first phone call since his inauguration. His call to Mr. Xi came on the same day that Taiwan officials met State Department diplomats in Washington. According to the White House, Mr. Biden expressed concerns about Beijing's unfair economic practices. He also brought up the crackdown in Xinjiang and China's assertive actions in the South China Sea. China says Mr. Xi warned Mr. Biden that confrontation would spell a disaster for both countries. Ties between both sides hit new lows during the Trump administration, and Chinese state media called this a chance for a new start. Now,中美关系正处于重要关口，推动中美关系健康稳定发展是两国人民和国际社会的共同期盼。你说过，美国最大的特点是可能性。
Simon Marks joins us from Washington, D.C. for more. Simon, Mr. Biden has announced a new Pentagon task force on China. What's their objective? Look, I mean, it's, a, it's an often uh, adopted tradition in the United States, Steve, that if you're not entirely sure what you want to do in any particular area of policy, you either create a commission or a policy review. And certainly Joe Biden uh, is signaling to the United States and to China that he needs more time before deciding exactly what his strategy uh, towards Beijing is going to be. So this review by the Pentagon is going to look at America's military footprint in Asia, technology and the use of it by both the United States and the Chinese in the region, intelligence gathering capacities, the role of allies and partnerships and other areas of strategy. And that issue about looking at the role of allies and partnerships is absolutely key here because what President Biden is essentially presenting uh, to President Xi is a situation in when, when is a situation in which when the United States communicates with China it doesn't do so simply on its own behalf but is doing so on behalf of a coalition of democracies and that's why the Pentagon review coupled with the geopolitical efforts that are underway by the Biden administration to reach out to governments in the region, uh, including the government of Singapore, the government of Japan, uh, with whom talks have already been had, according to uh, White House officials 24 hours ago. All of that is intended to create uh, what Joe Biden describes as a whole of government strategy towards China. Between now and the point at which that strategy is going to be unveiled, all of the Trump era tariffs and hardline policies towards China will remain unchanged. So this is partly Joe Biden kicking the can down the road, but it's also partly aimed, the White House insists, at coming up with a new whole of government, indeed, frankly, global response from Washington uh, to China's uh, current uh, assertive position in the region. Well, another part or another aspect of the relationship with China is uh, Taiwan, and the State Department has met Taiwan officials. Can Mr. Biden press ahead uh, with this without angering China? Very interesting timing for that meeting between Taiwan's representative here in Washington, D.C., and an assistant secretary of state. So on the one hand, uh, the Biden administration risking irking the Chinese by having that conversation just a matter of hours uh, after uh, President Xi and President Biden uh, held their phone call. But on the other hand, the Americans will say it was a relatively low-level conversation between uh, a senior official at the State Department and Taiwan's representative here. It's clearly designed to signify... Uh, that the United States intends to uh, continue adopting uh, an increasingly muscular stance uh, as far as Beijing is concerned towards Taiwan. Uh, U.S. officials say that that's required because uh, of China's increasingly assertive stance uh, towards Taiwan and other territorial issues uh, in the region. But it certainly indicates a willingness uh, on the part of the Biden administration to continue adopting a more muscular approach when it comes to having conversations with Taiwan at the risk of that creating additional pressure points in the relationship with Beijing. Yeah, thanks for that, Simon. Simon Mark, speaking to us from the U.S. Capitol. Tokyo Olympics chief Yoshiro Mori is expected to step down tomorrow following sexist comments that sparked outrage in Japan and abroad. He came under fire after saying that women talked too much at an Olympic committee meeting. Mr Mori has apologised again, telling local media that he could not let the controversy drag on and that he will explain his situation tomorrow. The International Olympic Committee had earlier considered the matter closed but branded his remarks completely inappropriate as criticism grew, the saga adds to a general disquiet over plans to hold the Games this summer, despite the ongoing pandemic. どんな影響も及ぶかって日本人もやっぱり海外の方も結構厳しいですし、日本のこれまでのその考え方の変革のいいチャンスというか、こういう発言をする人はやめることになるっていう一つの。
指標というかできたと思うのですごく意味があることだと思います。Mayor of the Olympics village, Saburo Kawabuchi, is widely expected to replace Mr. Mori. Reports say that the pair have met and Mr. Mori asked him to take the post. Mr. Kawabuchi told reporters that he would do his best to hold a successful Games if he's appointed. India and China have agreed to pull back troops from a key hotspot on their disputed border in the Himalayas. The breakthrough comes after a long military standoff and nine rounds of talks. Thousands of troops from both sides have begun disengaging from the Pagong So area in eastern Ladakh, and they've also agreed to dismantle defense structures. Once the first phase is complete, India says its military will meet within two days to discuss pulling back from other areas. Beijing has urged India to keep its word. The move is a positive turn in the worst military confrontation between the two neighbors in decades. The standoff began in April last year when India accused China's tre Chinese troops of intruding across the border. Twenty Indian soldiers were killed in clashes while the number of Chinese casualties is unknown. Still to come, a shot in the arm for the travel industry. Singapore Airlines flights take off with vaccinated crews. Taking the axe to long-haul flights, Cathay Pacific takes drastic action after crews have to now serve quarantine in Hong Kong. The chief orchestrator and the innocent victims. A military coup has dealt a serious blow to the hard-won democratic reforms in Myanmar. Will the army takeover mark the return of authoritarian rule and bring an end to the fragile democracy in Myanmar? Myanmar in crisis, a foreign special. Insight, tonight on CNA. Farming during Malaysia's lockdown is bearing fruit for a number of gardeners as they harvest their efforts in good time for festive feasting. Your Asia Now will look at how a focus on traditions is keeping the spirit of the season alive, even if they cannot celebrate homecoming for the Chinese New Year holiday. February 16th is Budget Day. Tune in as Singapore Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Heng Sui Kiet, delivers the budget statement in Parliament. Tuesday, live on CNA and CNA YouTube. I'm a really competitive person, now, basically. So this is one of the only spots since my site deteriorated that I got to be competitive at it. Based entirely on my ability. Like if I work hard, I can improve. Doesn't matter how blind I am. <laughs> so when I tell people that I'm able to use a phone, when I tell people that my phone allows me to read emojis, <laughs> that I can do coding or that I write on a computer, people are totally surprised. This is not to mention all the other things that I get up to in my spare time. This is blind guy does makeup. <laughs> all this anticipation that I don't know how I'm gonna start the video. Bihran, he has low vision. He cannot see far things. Even the close vision, he cannot see in detail. Even though he has visual challenges, I want to show how happy he is. Here in Thailand is the production plant of Xeon, a chemical manufacturer that produces a variety of material. Our products are based on this outstanding rubber compound technology, becoming material for various products, including automotive parts. In this way, these products produced in Thailand are delivered to around the world through our supply staff. This segment is brought to you by Xeon Corporation.
In business tonight, Singapore's GDP for 2020 could have dropped by more than 12 percent if not for a raft of budget support measures. The total cost over the past year has come close to $100 billion. The Finance Ministry's interim assessment report ahead of this year's budget shows relief measures helped halve the impact of COVID-19. But Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet says the fight is far from over. He says economic recovery is expected to be uneven and there will be targeted help for sectors still under stress. And he says Singapore needs to maintain fiscal discipline. Deborah Wong has more. Events manager Zi Wen En plans weddings and social functions at the hotel he works at. But when COVID-19 put a stop to these, he was at a loss. He had to move to the F&B department for six months. Wenen is one of a hundred staff in the Shangri-La Hotel Group who were redeployed to other roles last year. We were actually quite worried at first, but we were quite glad that the uh, hotel actually made assignment for us to actually be redesignated. Basically, we get to learn something different. On average, hotels received a million dollars each to pay their employees wages under the job support scheme. It's tiered, so sectors hit hardest by the pandemic get more help. The share of total job losses from industries that were most affected halved after the grants were issued. Over $22 billion was given out under the scheme from April to December. That makes up the bulk of over $27 billion in grants given out to businesses in total last year, a sharp increase from the previous year. Without support, the Finance Ministry says the unemployment rate could have gone up even more to exceed 6%. Instead, unemployment rate stood at 4.1% last year. While many schemes are ongoing, our early findings are that the measures have helped to cushion the impacts of the recession. The interim analysis is encouraging as it showed that the schemes are achieving the outcomes that they were designed for. But Mr Hink warned that the global climate remains uncertain. MOF expects the path to recovery to be longer than expected. Budget 2021 will be delivered on Tuesday. Nearly 76,000 people have secured work and training opportunities through the Singapore's uh, SG United Jobs and Skills Package. Nearly 80% have been placed into jobs. At the end of last year, nearly 130,000 positions were still available. The scheme was launched to help job seekers affected by the weaker economic outlook. Alif Amsha with more. Richmond Chan graduated from his engineering course at the height of the pandemic and didn't land a full-time job even after searching for four months. That pushed him to take up a traineeship instead. Six months in, he's gained footing at his workplace. I came in with, basic, with real basic uh, programming knowledge, uh, having taken only one module in university. And uh, I feel that I've grown a lot in terms of learning technical skills. They're very essential in this industry. I believe that uh, this would further enhance and broaden my ability for uh, employability in the future as well. More companies are offering opportunities like this, especially in Infocom. The sector has seen over 10,000 placements for work and training since the SG United Jobs and Skills Package was rolled out in May. Healthcare provided almost 5,000 placements, including executive and support roles. Another 11,000 positions came from manufacturing, as well as professional and food services. In many of these sectors, these were for long-term jobs. The Manpower Ministry also estimates that about 110,000 workers have been hired so far under the Jobs Growth Incentive Scheme. JGI provides wage support for employers that increase their local workforce. About half of those hired were aged 40 and above. The food services sector added the most workers, with close to 18,000 new hires, followed by wholesale trade and retail. Various government schemes have helped tremendously to cushion the impact and save jobs. And beyond the numbers, the assistance actually made real difference to people's lives. We must continue to help our vulnerable workers, including PMEs, so that all of us can protect and strengthen our social compact. In terms of support for households, they received about $2,000 per member on average through schemes like the Care and Support Package. While those earning less generally get more help, households from the lowest income bracket received less than those in the second quintile. 
That's because many were retirees who did not qualify for work-related relief. Still, the Finance Ministry says these measures have helped to mitigate inequality. Further analysis on these schemes could be carried out in future. Malaysia's economy has contracted at its fastest pace in more than two decades. GDP was down 5.6% last year, the worst performance since the Asian financial crisis. For the fourth quarter, the economy shrank 3.4% on year, worse than forecast as the resurgence of COVID-19 forced new restrictions. The services sector was a major drag, down nearly 5%. A major focus now is relaxing curbs on small businesses. The central bank chief says hopes for recovery are pinned on the vaccine rollout that begins later this month. The outlook for external demand is stronger compared with last year, with positive developments surrounding the rollout of vaccine. With the global economy on a recovery path, the fit-for-purpose restrictions and SOPs in the manufacturing sector enables our exporters to capitalise on this robust demand. The launch of the vaccination programme in Malaysia later this month will lift sentiment and provide a clear path towards resolving the pandemic. Gareth Leather from Capital Economics joins us live. Thanks for joining us. Now, is the worst over for Malaysia? Um, I think that the current quarter is actually going to be the low point for the economy. That a, a surge in cases, as you said in your clip, has led the government to reimpose quite stringent restrictions across the economy. And as a result, it seems likely that the economy will probably contract again this quarter. But provided the vaccine rollout continues as the government hopes and that and the, the government is able to keep a lid on new cases, then the, the recovery should should continue from the second quarter onwards. Right, there seems to be growing uncertainty over this year. As a year of recovery, what's the outlook for the rest of Asia? Uh, the rest of Asia, I think, is very much going to depend on, on, on the vaccine and also on the progress of the virus as well. That In some countries, for example, Taiwan and China, they're, they're pretty much close to eliminating the virus, with exports likely to remain strong thanks to robust global demand and recovery in the global economy. They should continue to do quite well. I'm more concerned about the outlook for places like Indonesia and the Philippines, where virus cases are still very high. There's no sign that they're bringing the virus into control. Fiscal policy hasn't been as supportive as elsewhere in the region. The vaccine rollout is likely to be quite slow. Those countries are likely to experience the slowest recovery, and there's also most uncertainty about those places too. Right. So will the speed of vaccination rollouts determine which countries bounce back quicker, you think? I think it's going to have a big role to play. And it's certainly for, for the places that I mentioned that haven't got the virus under control. For them, a vaccine rollout, a rapid vaccine rollout could be a real game changer for the economy. I think for places like Taiwan, Vietnam, China, where social distancing domestically isn't a big drag on growth, a vaccine rollout probably won't have a, a, a big impact on the outlook for this year, but for, for some parts of Asia, certainly will do, yes. All right, across the board in Asia, when will we see a return to growth at pre-pandemic levels? Um, it, it depends where you're looking again. So Taiwan's economy is, is already you know, producing more than arguably it would have done had the virus not happened. But in places like the Philippines, it's still kind of 5 10% below its pre-crisis level. So... It very much depends across the board. We're hopeful that, you know, as virus cases probably continue to fall in many places, vaccine rollouts progress, that, that by the end of this year, most countries will, GDP will exceed its pre-crisis level. But it's, it's, it's very uncertain times at the moment for many countries, obviously. All right. Thank you for your analysis. That's Gareth Leather from Capital Economics. Hong Kong's flag carrier Cathay Pacific is axing all flights to Australia except for Sydney. A number of other long-haul flights, including to Vancouver, San Francisco, Frankfurt and Amsterdam, are also being called. The move comes after the Hong Kong government enforced a mandatory 14-day quarantine on all flight crew who've stayed outside China. Cathay says that will affect its ability to service flights. 
Volkswagen and Microsoft are joining forces to develop self-driving cars. The automaker will tap on Microsoft's cloud computing services so that it can deploy software updates to cars faster. Vehicles already on the road with driver assistance features could be able to receive software updates over time, possibly bringing them closer to autonomous driving. AstraZeneca is expecting its profits to grow this year after beating forecasts for quarterly drug sales. It says growth in earnings will be 18 to 24 percent after a 15 percent rise last year. The London-listed firm says its forecast does not include any impact from its COVID-19 vaccine. It plans to report sales of the inoculation separately. The company has pledged not to profit from the vaccine during the pandemic. Much is riding on the British developed shot since it's cheaper and can be distributed more easily than vaccines from its competitors. And that's your business update. Back to you, Steve. Yep, many thanks, Eugenia. And still to come, Donald Trump accused of putting his vice president at risk as his impeachment trial continues. Cheering sanctions from the U.S. as President, President Biden takes action against the generals involved in Myanmar's coup. My name is Douglas Lan. After my grandfather passed away, my family received a mysterious envelope of cash from a clan association. I meet young Singaporeans who take me on a quest to find out are clans even relevant today? is my second home. Remember our house. Friday on CNA. Breaking news. Chanting for Prime Minister Prayut Chanacha to step down. We will be seeing sporadic protests flare up from time and time again. Key developments. 37 ASEAN Summit. Live events. Analysis and perspectives. We will really be seeing vaccines soon. Imports, which were expected to grow slightly, contracted 2.1%. News that matters. Asia Now, daily. On CNA. is Budget Day. Tune in as Singapore Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Heng Sui Kiet, delivers the budget statement in Parliament. Tuesday, live on CNA and CNA YouTube. Updating tonight's top stories, U.S. President Joe Biden has oppressed Chinese leader Xi Jinping on Hong Kong trade and human rights in their first phone call since his inauguration. 
Tokyo Olympics chief Yoshihiro Mori will step down tomorrow after his sexist comments sparked outrage in Japan and abroad. And Myanmar arrests dozens more politicians and activists as protests against the military coup continue for the sixth straight day. Demonstrators are also taking aim at China, claiming Beijing supports the takeover. The United States has also imposed sanctions on Myanmar's generals. The action has been welcomed by the Myanmar community in the United States. Many of them escaped military rule in the past, and the current takeover has stirred up painful memories, as Nick Harper reports. Democracy! Democracy! Standing up for human rights in their homeland. This is one of multiple protests organized in the U.S. since the coup. This one in Indianapolis. Student Sui Pa helped to organize it. Well, it's very emotional. I am very frustrated um, with the situation. I just really hoped and prayed that uh, the people in Myanmar are safe, especially my family. I think that's everyone's hope. Many here, including Sui, have struggled to contact relatives and friends still back in Myanmar. I am really angry, but all I can do right now is just to really play my part by spreading awareness and do what I can for my people. The largest Burmese population outside of Myanmar is in the U.S. state of Indiana. Elisa Vani established the Burmese American Community Institute there 10 years ago. The recent coup has brought back memories for many who, like him, fled Myanmar years before to escape military arrest. We are shocked. And the Burmese here were sad. We feel that we have lost our future, the Burma future. So now, as a community here, we had to take some actions. And so has the U.S. president. The U.S. government is taking steps to prevent the generals from improperly a having access to the $1 billion in Burmese government funds held in the United States. And today, I've approved a new executive order, <laughs> excuse me, a new executive order enabling us to immediately sanction the military leaders who directed the coup, their business interests, as well as close family members. The sanctions followed several U.S. government statements expressing deep concern. Some, though, had been urging a stronger response. I think it's immensely important that the United States, which is, of course, a superpower on the global stage, that it takes a very strong position in opposition to the coup and for accountability for what has happened in terms of atrocities in Myanmar's past, that it links those two things together and says, we are a government that stands for human rights. And so it remains a tense time, watching from afar, knowing many of their relatives remain in Myanmar with an uncertain future. Which is why many Burmese here also want the Biden administration to offer increased aid and assistance to civilians in the country, a combination of sanctions and support that they hope will return Myanmar to the democratic path they've seen it walk on in recent years. Nick Harper, CNA, Washington. Dr. Michael Vatikiotis joins us now for a closer look. Dr. Vatikiotis, these are not the first sanctions on members of Myanmar's military. What impact can they have? Well, I think the impact will ultimately be limited because the military for many years has suffered from in Myanmar from sanctions and has accustomed itself to uh, dealing through informal channels. Uh, there's a huge... Um, uh, economy, a conflict economy in Myanmar lives off jade and, and narcotics from which a great deal of income is derived in the country. And so these formal sanctions on the military, I don't think will have much impact. The important thing, of course, is that many people were saying that it's the Myanmar people that are suffering, not just because of the coup, but because of the COVID pandemic. And it's, you know, the, the levels of poverty and unemployment have increased. And so it's important for the international community not to uh, bring more suffering upon the Myanmar people themselves. And what do you make of the protesters' attention shifting to the Chinese embassy now? 
Well, there have been several reports, um, and one has to be really careful about this because there's a great deal of sort of disinformation and the potential for information wars over China's role or alleged support for the coup. And there were reports yesterday about air aircraft arriving at the airport in, in Rangoon and possibly unloading equipment to um, contribute to the shutdown of the internet or interference with social media. This has not been confirmed. Um, and I think one has to be really cautious about these reports. But there is a great deal of suspicion that China may be supportive of the military. I don't think that's necessarily the case. And from what we've seen of debate within China, there is a divided opinion on this. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there are concerns and suspicions about China's support for the current situation uh, with the military takeover. Well, meantime, there has been this new wave of arrests. Uh, and we do know that next week there's a potential court appearance by Aung San Suu Kyi as well. Do you think this is going to fuel more protests? Well, on the one hand, it's good that she will be produced in court, and so people will see that she's okay. And I think for the international community, one of the biggest concerns has been whether or not she's been held um, safely and securely, and, and, and is she okay? And so producing her in court will, I think, on the one hand, provide a degree of sort of uh, assurance that she's okay. On the other hand, I think it will increase, and what we've seen consistently over the last 10 days is a buildup of popular anger uh, on the streets of Rangoon. And I think we'll see more of this. Um, the military has decided not to crack down immediately, hoping perhaps that the crowds will dissipate. Um, but this, I think, will increase the passion uh, and support for her. And there is talk of a clampdown on the internet and communications. Uh, what role has social media played in this past week of demonstrations? It's a very interesting question, Steve, because I think what's in a way, the ability and the availability of people to be on social media has in many ways had a, a reasonably calming effect because it means that people can vent their frustrations, if you like, indoors without taking to the streets. And it's when the internet gets shut down that people feel the need to go out onto the streets and protest. And I think the government has also realized that shutting off the internet also shuts down the economy. I mean, the sheer fact is that ATM machines won't work without the internet. And so they need to keep the economy going and keep livelihoods going uh, versus whether or not they shut down the internet to prevent organized protests. So it's a very, very difficult um, situation. Uh, and I think by and large, the internet has kept going. It, it's, it's available. Uh, and I think people have used the internet very cleverly. They've used Thai SIM cards to get around uh, the restrictions on, on Myanmar SIM cards. And I think the messages are coming out and people are posting very actively and it's fueling the protests. Well, thank you very much for sharing your perspective with us this evening, Dr. Michael Vatia Curtis uh, from the Center of Humanitarian Dialogue. Now, the first flights from Singapore Airlines, Silk Air and Scoot with fully vaccinated crews have taken off. Transport Minister Ong Yi Kang has seen off the flights to Jakarta, Bangkok and Phnom Penh. It's a landmark day for a sector that's been crippled by COVID-19. Aviation and maritime workers have been prioritized for vaccinations because of the sector's importance and role in economic recovery. Gwyneth Tia with more. Flight stewardess Go Yiling is about to make history. Her flight to Jakarta is manned entirely by crew who've had both shots of the vaccine. Ms Goh received her second dose just a few days ago. And while it takes up to two weeks for the body to build a strong response, she says she feels a lot safer doing her job. Because I'm flying around cross-border international, so it's very important that we protect ourselves and don't bring back any COVID or virus to anybody around us. SIA Group says more than 90% of cabin crew and pilots across its three airlines have signed up to be inoculated. Nearly all of them have received their first dose. We're confident that our crew will be substantially vaccinated, uh, certainly by end of uh, the next month, and that um, you would then expect that majority of our flights, vast majority, would be, would be uh, crewed by 
uh, crew get fully vaccinated. Even as air crew and aviation staff get vaccinated, that doesn't necessarily spell the immediate return of flights and passengers. That still very much depends on border restrictions, especially in an unpredictable global situation that's constantly changing. Transport Minister Ong Yi Kang says vaccinating aviation workers not only raises confidence in Singapore as an air hub, it also helps keep the situation within the country stable. Given our, our situation where internally Singapore is quite safe, we have got the uh, virus under control with very low community cases, our biggest vulnerability is actually the border. If the border staff that come into contact with the outside world are all vaccinated, I think we really strengthen and we really we would have really taken a very big step in securing our border and keeping Singapore even safer. 39,000 or more than 90% of frontline staff in the aviation and maritime sectors have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. About 14,000 others working with bus and train operators have also gotten their first jabs. U.S. Democratic lawmakers are set to wrap up a final day of arguments against Donald Trump in his impeachment trial. The Democrats have already presented chilling security footage of the Capitol siege. Some video had never been seen before. Democrats describe Mr. Trump as the inciter-in-chief who sparked the deadly attack by winding up his supporters. You will see. In this new security video, you can see the mob attacking officers with a crutch, a hockey stick, a bullhorn, and a Trump flag. I want to show you that same attack from the officer's perspective from his body camera footage. The footage also shows lawmakers being taken to safety by Capitol Police, many just seconds ahead of the advancing mob. The group includes Vice President Mike Pence and Republican Senator Mitt Romney. 17 Republican senators will need to vote with the Democrats to secure a conviction. So far, only six have agreed that the trial is even constitutional. Frank. Melbourne is calling on residents to come forward and get tested for COVID-19. There are concerns of growing community transmission of the more infectious UK variant of the coronavirus. A cluster linked to a quarantine hotel has grown to 11 cases. All three of the new infections in Victoria today are linked to the Holiday Inn. They were already isolating. However, more contact tracing is underway. Over 22,000 tests have been carried out in the past 24 hours. I seek to support every state to be as successful as they possibly can be in what they're doing to manage the health issues around the COVID pandemic. I'm absolutely confident it was a single event uh, that uh, hazard has been removed. Uh, and so far, it, now, now it's about making sure that anyone that might be in the community who is positive is found and, and, and isolated. Still to come, festive cheer puts pandemic fears on hold, but Hong Kong residents still need to be on their toes and a different vibe at Singapore's Chinatown this year. The chief orchestrator and the innocent victims. A military coup has dealt a serious blow to the hard-won democratic reforms in Myanmar. Will the army take over, mark the return of authoritarian rule? and bring an end to the fragile democracy in Myanmar. Myanmar in Crisis, a foreign special. Insight, tonight on CNA. It was eerily similar to the SARS outbreak. There were cynics and people skeptical and saying, were we overreacting? He asked me, sister, am I going to die? We know every decision impacts people and businesses. Leaving no Singaporean behind. If they wanted to come back, we would have to find a way. Believe, Saturday and Sunday on CNA. Every day, the financial world goes through dramatic rise and falls. 
We'll track the biggest market movers and show you where the opportunities lie. Get the experts take on the performance of key indices. Plus all the analysis to help you understand forces driving global economies. The daily business news you need, only on CNA. This segment is brought to you by Xeon Corporation. This February sees the opportunity for change through sustainability, crisis management and cultural transformation. Climate for Change. Find out how businesses pivoted to become more sustainable by reskilling, refocusing and adapting to technology. Believe. Discover how Singapore's leaders led a nation to overcome one of the world's biggest crises in recent history. There's something about Orchard. Uncover how the 1960s transformed this iconic road through fashion, food, music and dance. This February on CNA. To understand the Philippines, one must understand the Filipino people, scattered throughout more than 7,000 islands. Resilient, fighting for better lives, even if it means making a living thousands of kilometers away from home. Their faith and sense of community keep them strong in the face of adversities. The Filipino spirit of Bayanihan never wanes. The concept of peering and looking and discovering is important. Artist shows his idea through a painting. I show myself throughout dishes that I make. Remarkable Living Season 3, Sunday on CNA. Singapore is getting ready to ring in Chinese New Year under the shadow of the global pandemic. It's a different season and vibe at Chinatown. Nisha Rahim is there. She joins us now for the latest. Uh, Nisha, tell us what the atmosphere is like. Well, absolutely, Steve. I'm right here at Pagoda Street at Chinatown, and it's a usual spot for the Festive Street Bazaar, where, you know, usually it's flooded with red and gold lanterns. But this time, uh, the street is completely devoid of its usual glitz. And it's the first time the bazaar has actually, pardon me, yeah, the mask, it's the first time the bazaar has been called off since it started in 1989. Now, this is part of measures by the crowd, part, this is part of measures by authorities to control the crowds in the area. Now, one interesting aspect that actually happened is the spectacular street light up that was not supposed to illuminate uh, the streets of Chinatown during the eve of Chinese New Year um, is actually lit up this evening. And Singapore Tourism Board actually said it's due to reduce crowds as well as um, observed in Chinatown over the weekend. And the street light up is, um, will resume from 7 p.m. today to 6 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, but of course, visitors are doing some last minute shopping uh, to buy goodies, plants and decorations despite lesser stalls opening. Now, shop owners say that uh, businesses have, I mean, businesses for New Year's Eve sales have plunged by 20%. Let's take a look at what they had to say. Previous year was better because no COVID, no nothing, so it was better. But now because of COVID, everybody want to come out, they're scared to come out. Today is not so crowded, not like the last time got the... The Chinese New Year Pasar Malam. Now this year is uh, very, very quiet. Uh. We will see whether is there any some goodies or you know things to actually buy. Yeah, probably to actually just prepare for Chinese New Year. Just basically walk around and see any New Year stuff to, for small deco. Just had my reunion dinner nearby. Yeah, so then come and take a walk. Okay. So actually, I'm not sure whether the lights were on previously, so I was a bit surprised when the lights came on. So I just popped by. Anisha, safe distancing had been a key concern in Chinatown lately due to the festive season. Uh, but am I right in thinking there's perhaps uh, not such a concern this evening as things are quite quiet? Well, you're absolutely right. So while self-entry protocols are being adhered to, uh, guests are being asked to maintain a safe distance as well. Uh, it's because we're, I'm observing many safe, distance, the safe distancing ambassadors as well as police officers here to actually monitor the crowds. Um, well, though some shoppers and business owners actually agree that this time it's a quieter, uh, it's a quieter affair at Chinatown, uh, but really the visitors here are really trying to soak up what's left of the atmosphere here at Chinatown. Back to oh. you, Steve. All right, May, thanks for that report. Nisha Rahim speaking to us from Chinatown in Singapore. 
Thousands of Malaysians will be spending Chinese New Year away from family. They're stuck here in Singapore because of travel restrictions brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Afifa Arifin finds out how they're celebrating away from home. Celebrating Chinese New Year this year will be a whole new experience for 56-year-old banker Ho Chin Shin. It's his first time spending it away from his family and friends in his hometown Sarawak in East Malaysia, despite living abroad in Singapore for about eight years now. In Kuching, our Chinese New Year celebrations have always been the, a blast. It's uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of uh, sights and sounds, firecrackers. I remember that I would buy the flight tickets from uh, Singapore to uh, Sarawak like uh, 10 months before the uh, next uh, Chinese New Year. Uh, this year, unfortunately, uh, the uh, ticket has been uh, cancelled. The flights have been cancelled. So, uh, is uh, something that is uh, totally uh, unexpected. Like Mr Ho, returning home for the festive break is not an option for many Malaysians living or working in Singapore due to the ongoing travel restrictions. So to help some Malaysians feel less alone this festive season, some members of the Malaysian Association in Singapore have welcomed their fellow countrymen into their homes. That's the culture we grew up with, you know, the open house, the feeding people, the wanting to welcome people from our own home, uh, hometown, um, into our own homes. You know, it, as long as we're Malaysian, we all kind of understand each other. Um, so this is really why the initiative even started. Healthcare frontliner Wendy Ng has also chosen to remain here. She's concerned by the state of COVID-19 infections across the causeway and is also deterred by the costs and time in quarantine, which one has to bear in order to cross borders. I think the quarantine time serve is the major issue and also because I work in a high-risk environment, I, don't really, I really do not want to bring any transmission back and forth whether to my family or to my patients. Instead, Ms. Ng will celebrate with her colleagues, some of whom are also unable to return to their respective countries. She's also lucky to have some familiar faces here, friends who have become like a second family to her. But even as Malaysians here embrace a different festive season, the thought of missing family reunion dinners still stung. I think um, it has been tough. Actually, it's already been a year that I haven't been able to see them. Um, you know, it's going to be another birthday missed, um, another Chinese New Year missed. So I think the best I can do right now is just call my mom every day and my dad as well, you know, video call. At least we have technology right now. With vaccinations being rolled out globally, it's hoped that the time will soon come for borders to be reopened and families reunited. People in Hong Kong have been told to stay vigilant during the Chinese New Year holidays, but even pandemic concerns haven't stopped many visiting the city's festive flower markets. Dennis Chong reports. Just feel the hustle and bustle of this popular flower market in Kowloon. You can hardly find a clue of a global pandemic, except that everybody is wearing a mask. But Hong Kong is actually still riding through the fourth wave of its coronavirus outbreak, with an average of dozens of local cases reported every day. Nonetheless, as part of the Chinese New Year celebrations, shoppers have still come out in schools to snap up their auspicious items. It's not quite business as usual for the retailers, however, as they are facing a double whammy with an economic downturn and a government decision to extend social distancing rules beyond the New Year. Many official celebrations have been cancelled and this year's mega flower fair has been downsized due to COVID concerns. So traders have to look to places like this one for the seasonal patrons. But there are still people who want to keep this festive spirit alive by decorating their homes with their favourite blooms. Be it peach blossoms for those looking out for romance or just daffodils for floral aroma. To many people, not only do these flowers give you great delight, but they also help you usher in the best fortunes for the new year. I seldom go to a flower market in the previous year, but this year I really want some stimulation for me. Yeah, so boring in the whole year without any traveling, uh, stay away from family members. So this is the reason I want to see some atmosphere of new year from the flower market. Um, I really hope um, everyone good health and then no need to wear masks and then um, everyone can go dining, no more limitation.
without any with, without any limitation. Hong Kong has not experienced a full lockdown since the pandemic started, but the residents have to put up with anti-COVID-19 measures on a daily basis for almost a year now. And this is affecting even this temple right here. For the first time since 100 years ago, the famous Taoist Wong Tai Sin Temple has to cancel its New Year incense burning ritual to avoid crowds. Normally, the event attracts thousands of worshippers who want to be the first one to make a witch with a burning stick at the stroke of midnight in the New Year. For those who want to present offerings to the ancient gods, there are also extra steps to take. The government is requiring every visitor to register at the temple, either with staff or with this mobile phone. On February the 12th, the hard-working, tolerant and faithful Austin shrugged off the rats to take center stage in the Chinese zodiac. The past two years have been tough for Hong Kong, with a global pandemic following an unprecedented social unrest in 2019. As the city welcomes the year of Ox, residents perhaps have to borrow the spirit of the animal as they hope for a better year ahead. For many across Asia, it's Happy New Year. The year of the Ox is just hours away. While celebrations across the region have been scaled down this year, that hasn't dampened the festive spirit. In Taiwan, traditional markets are abuzz after much success in containing the pandemic. While in Wuhan, it's a poignant celebration a year after overcoming the pandemic. Well, many are hoping that the Year of the Ox will bring better luck, wealth and health. That's Asia Tonight. We'll leave you now with Chinese New Year celebrations across the region. Good night. Bye for now.